Hey, welcome to Tape to Tape, powered by the new Ram 1500 Sport, built exclusively for Canadians. Lots to talk about today, Rory. Lots mm. to talk about. Unfortunately, some of it, not the greatest subject matter. A lot of injuries out there in the league. Yeah. Seems like the... Big the, names, yeah, too. Yeah, very big names on the sideline right now. Uh, we do have a trade to talk about, and we're going to bring in Ian McIntyre, Sportsnet's West Coast man, uh, to talk about the Vancouver Canucks. A very, very special night in Vancouver, raising the Sedin jerseys to the rafters. Are the Sedins the greatest Vancouver Canucks in franchise history? We're going to put that to Ian along, of course, with how he thinks that team will approach the deadline. But let's start with a trade we do have, the Pittsburgh Penguins picking up Jason Zucker, who mm -hmm. has been traded before. <laughs> uh, he just stayed in Minnesota <laughs> uh, because uh, things didn't quite work out there in a, in a deal with Calgary last year. Now yep. he is going to play with Sidney Crosby and the Penguins. What did you make of that trade, and what are the possible ramifications, the fallout, the impact on the winger market there? Well, I mean, finally, right? Finally, he gets traded somewhere, and Pittsburgh was one of the teams that had been linked to him in the past Long two time. years. Probably he's been on the market. Um, and, you know, it, this, is a, this is a Minnesota team that really seems to be in need of just making some moves. Um, and what this accomplishes this for them is, first of all, they get the first round pick from Pittsburgh, so you can start rebuilding an organization. Kalen Addison coming back as an asset. Um, but with Galchenyuk, his expiring contract, I mean, that's cap room that's now opening up too. And that's also part of the problem with Minnesota is you look at some of these contracts, you got Parise and Suter still long-term, Matt Zuccarello, who you just signed as a free agent long-term, uh, Matt Dumba long-term. Like there's a lot of big money that's that you're tied to for a long time. So part of what they need to accomplish here is getting – firsts and prospects to reshape everything but also figure out ways that they can open up cap space to reshape with um, and so I think they accomplished what they needed to in the Zucker trade and same thing for Pittsburgh I mean it's been said many times as long as they have Evgeny Malkin and Sidney Crosby you're all in you're trying to win as many cups as you can before these guys are at the end of their careers and uh, you know, with injury to Jake Gensel, especially they needed some scoring help on the wings and Zucker is exactly what's going to accomplish that for you. Wouldn't really expect Jim Rutherford to be done. He's always kind of in the bushes looking to make a trade here and there. And um, this this is probably the big one for them, though. Uh, the guy who can score 20, 25 goals, maybe a little bit more in a, in a certain situation alongside Sidney Crosby and Benny Malkin doesn't yeah. get much better than that. Um, and basically, he is the Gensel fill-in. Maybe he's the guy that can launch even further up playing next to those guys. And I mean, Pittsburgh, it, it almost doesn't seem to matter what injury hits them this year. Even Sidney Crosby's injury didn't slow them down. So they're just going to keep churning, keep churning, and, and it's, a, it's a great pickup for them. So Bill Guerin, a GM in his first year in Minnesota, says they're not throwing in the towel on the playoffs, yet if he sees a drop mm. in effort, there's more guys going out the door. Is Minnesota finally an interesting team here? Interesting in the sense that there's moves to be <laughs> that made. things yeah. could happen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Not on the ice. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, not not so much on the ice. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I think they are one of these teams that's the key to kind of unlocking a busier trade deadline than maybe we think it is. Like Matt Dumba's name has been sure. out there. We know um, Jonas Brodin's name is starting to float out there too. And and I f I do find it hard to believe that both of those guys would go before the deadline. Again, with term on your contract, those are more likely to happen in the summer. But to Garen's point, if they go on a losing skid here or there's no life in that team, maybe he does look to move one or both of those guys. And you could get, uh, because they're termed and because they're top four, you could get all kinds of futures back for them uh, if you really wanted to. You know, there's probably no getting out from under the Parise or, or Suter contracts. But you wonder even about a guy like Kevin Fiala, who you acquired from Nashville just last year. Like it's, he's been playing well so recently. He's been playing well. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of the, the difficult is what do you move forward with? Yeah. Um, Fiala would seem like a guy that you would be comfortable that, moving forward. But at the same time, he's going to give you back sure. what you need. So this, this is, again, like Garen hasn't rushed into making any moves. And maybe he won't rush into making these ones. But if the right move comes along and you're just looking to shake things up there, that's the kind of player that will get you back what you need. Yes or no, is Alex Galchenyuk in the NHL next year? Wow, that's a fantastic question. Can you believe we're asking this question not even two years after he was traded 
to the Arizona Coyotes where they were going to play him at center yep. and the Canadian fans were going to live to re- regret the day yep. that he was ever sent away. And, and here we are. He's been traded twice already. Can't make it work in Pittsburgh. Yeah. This is he's he's a UFA and down to his his last eight week audition here. Yeah, and even after going to Pittsburgh, the story was well, if he gets to play with Crosby or Malkin, maybe that can finally get him going and get him scoring the goals that he's always creating all these chances for. And d- just not didn't happen. Didn't happen. Um, and I've seen some Pittsburgh reporters talk about tweet about how this he's, guy works he's hard. Working hard. He's trying it's to not, make it happen. Yeah, it's not because he's he's out there just goofing around and everything like that. Like he is putting in the effort, and it's just not happening. So. You know, he makes $4.9 million this year. That's obviously, if he's in the NHL next year, that's getting slashed. Probably at least in half, if not he's more He's on a that. show-me contract if he's back next year. Yeah. Um, I I would have to think someone in the NHL gives him a shot. I mean, if if someone like Montreal gives Ilya Kovalchuk a shot on $700,000 just to see, I have to think someone gives the same shot to a 26, 27-year-old Alex Galchenyuk. Sure. Same kind of thing. Cheap. See what happens. One year deal. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't, then he probably goes to the KHL or somewhere else the following year. But I don't think you go from 4.9 to completely out of the NHL at that age without somebody first giving you a really cheap show me contract. Anytime Connor McDavid is on the shelf, that's the lead story in terms of injuries. Thankfully, you know, you're always concerned, especially given what happened at the end of last year when he. Um, when we knew something had even happened yeah. in the game, um, turns out to be a two to, to three week uh, quad injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, Columbus just devastated yeah. by the loss of uh, Seth Jones. Cam Atkinson also out. Shea Weber out for an yeah. extended period for the Montreal Canadiens. Just seems yeah. like there's been an avalanche of these injuries. It's- I mean, it's everywhere, and it's huge names. That yeah. are, this is this is the curveball that you wonder how many of these injuries are going to influence what the teams can or want to do at the trade deadline. I don't think it matters so much for the Oilers, but for Columbus, you know, after going all in last year, they're probably less likely to be as aggressive this year. But they're they're right there, and they can they're, make the playoffs. Yeah. Um, they might be in a better position. I have to check. They might actually be in a better position this year. Like. Two yeah. or three points in versus even where they were last I, year. I think at the deadline last year they were one point in. in. So anything better go. than that, and yeah, you're in a better situation. So, um, but but losing Seth Jones, uh, yeah, I mean, you just might have to do something to give a little boost to the back. Ryan Murray's out for them too. I mean, he seems he's always out, but uh, you need to do something to possibly help you there. The goaltending has been just an amazing story for them. Even up front, you're getting hurt. You mentioned Cam Atkinson, Josh Anderson. He's not having a very good year, but you know, when healthy, this guy can approach 30 goals. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Kekalainen does something to try and help them, but that necessarily wasn't necessarily the case before these injuries hit. They probably could have just kept going on um, and it would have been fine, but maybe you, you adjust now. Um, in Montreal, you know, when there were the rumors that Weber's long-term health was... There was two crazy hours there on Twitter, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, then it, then it was, okay, does that make them more likely to just sign Jeff Petrie now and lock him in? And it turns out, Shea Weber is only going to miss the next four to six weeks, according to the team, which opens up a window that he comes back. Again, for Montreal, I don't know how much that changes for them because it's more about next season. Yeah. We've talked about that on the podcast before, so I don't think it matters so much to them. But but these injuries just keep hitting everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. I mean, with with what happened with Jay Bomeister on the bench, it's a horrifying incident this week. Um, I wouldn't expect him to be returning this year. And again, that's a St. Louis Blues team that's going for the Stanley Cup, where before they maybe weren't looking for a defense, and maybe now they have to, because Bo Meester is an excellent you know, veteran presence yeah. minute guy on that team, so they might have a need for a defenseman that they didn't previously have. Favorite Sedin memory, moment, uh, impression? You know, impression. I mean, I can remember, <laughs> it's funny, I can remember their draft day, and like looking at the Hockey News Magazine that day and where they were ranked and all the knocks on them. Um, I remember it was like Pavel Brendel, I think, was in that yep. draft. And, and it was like, well, that guy's the bigger guy. And look at his numbers and Playing everything in like the that. Dub. And, yeah, and, you, and, and all the knocks for, on the Sedins for being too soft and everything like that. And then the, obviously the huge trade Brian Burke made to be able to bring them both into Vancouver. I mean, I, I probably, like many, was really skeptical at first of... How, 
remember when they broke in, it, the NHL wasn't what it is today. It was slower, tougher, a lot less ice to work with. You could clutch and grab and all this stuff, and it didn't seem to fit that mold. And it's worth pointing out, they didn't really start to shoot off until 05, 06, after the lockout, after all the rule changes, and it did open up. Um, so I wonder... We'll never truly know how much they benefited by those changes. They were great players, great skill in their own right, but I, I always am going to wonder what their careers would have looked like if the game didn't change. And thankfully, we don't have to thankfully, know. Thankfully, <laughs> I mean, the game's obviously better That's for right. what happened, right? So, um, you know, they. You know, what they ended up doing with their careers is just uh, amazing. It's a shame that they never won a Stanley Cup. They did get to the final, of course, but the way the way they evolved, the, the way the narrative, I guess, around them evolved and changed, and then the cherry on top with the ceremony that they had Wednesday night in Vancouver retiring their jerseys was just, uh, I mean, when I was watching that, I was thinking back to memories of their draft year and like man you, you just never know where these players are going to go because no, well, everybody not, around them well the 99 <laughs> draft in particular i was writing about it last year on the 20 year anniversary but of course patrick stefan yep. went first pavel brindle ended up going fourth that whole first round just ended yep. up really being a uh, flop after flop and uh there were the the two guys that you really didn't know if someone could leave with both of them but brian burke did and as he's often said, came away from the World Juniors that year saying we're trading the pick. Can't remember what uh, what originally they were uh, they were going to pick, but he was going to trade the first rounder because he didn't like anyone and mm -hmm. didn't like um, didn't like what the Sedins brought. And then it was at the World Championship that uh, they sh demonstrated to him that you know playing against high level competition and, and grown men that all right, there's a little something here. And turns out uh, mm -hmm. the scouting staff there was right. They knocked out the knock knocked the pitcher to the park. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, we're going to talk more Sedin, of course, with Ian McIntyre later on in the show. So stick around for that and more on Tape to Tape. Hey, welcome back to Tape to Tape. If you're listening to this podcast, I think there's a real good chance you're into fantasy hockey. If that is the case, don't forget to sign up for the Sportsnet Fantasy Pool presented by Ram at sportsnet.ca forward slash Ram. You can get in on some cash prizes of up to 50 grand. And of course, the grand prize is a 2020 Ram 1500 Sport. Rory, I'm a little closer to finishing in the money in one of my pools because mm -hmm. I picked up Kyler Yamamoto about three or four weeks ago. And Huge. boy, that <laughs> thing the Oilers never have, you know, a little scoring depth, a little yep. homegrown outside the top five talent. They're finally uh, hitting here with this guy who, you know, it's taken a little while. Obviously, yep. he... He jumped onto the scene right after the draft year, but he's been seasoning a bit, and now it seems to really be paying off. Yeah, started him lower in the lineup. Didn't take him long to get up into that top six. And now, right now, without Connor McDavid, the line that he's on with Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Leon Dreisaitl is just so key to keeping the playoff hopes for that team going while the best player in the world is on the sidelines. And not only that, but he's completely changed the trade deadline needs for this team. I mean, without Kyler Yamamoto... Um, you had a clear need for some level of scoring on the wings. And he comes in, and he's just crushing it. So basically, that's a trade deadline pickup that the Oilers have already made. And if they do something, there's less pressure on them now to have to do something to just get this team into the playoffs. Maybe they can nibble around the edges or something like that. Um, but but prior to that, you know, they could have been in the market for just about any winger. And the only thing is, and Ken Holland has talked about this, doesn't really want to move that first round pick or Yessi Pugliarvi or anything really for a rental. And so if the Oilers do anything, you're looking at a guy who's either under contract or young enough that he's going to be an RFA that you've got controllable years here. And one name that's started to pop up onto the rumor mill, and I can't understand why other than he's having a bad year i guess is andre kasha in anaheim and that's the kind of player that edmonton previously would have been interested in and maybe they still are depending on the price for him um, but he's an rfa after next season and so you've got at least three or four years of control here for him and i have to say like prior to this year the two years prior to this year combined his goals per 60 minutes at five on five rate was tied with Alex Ovechkin for third best in the NHL behind only Not Austin bad Matthews company. and Victor Arvidsson. Yeah. yeah, and that's a stat that kind of predicted, that allowed you to foresee a breakout coming for Jacob Vrana this year. Doesn't right. always predict it, but it gives you an idea of what can come. 
He's had concussion issues in the past, um, definitely struggling this year with just seven goals on a bad, low-scoring Anaheim Ducks team. But, man, like that's a player. If a team like Edmonton or even Calgary, both of them could still use some help on scoring on the wings, if you can somehow get him for a reduced cost with the control and the potential that he's got, I mean, that's a guy I'm going at and just taking a shot on because it's got Yamamoto-like payoff coming uh you mentioned minnesota in the last block is a team that could spice up the deadline and i'm interesting because they have desirable parts but they're all under term like yep. two or three years in some cases yep you just really question how motivated they w- i mean it's as easy to see the logic for why they'd keep the fowlers and yes. mansons of the world as to why they trade them so it's really going to take something to pry them out If those guys do move, if Anaheim does decide to go down that path, it's going to be a spicier deadline than we anticipated. Yeah, I mean, Manson is the big name. He's under contract for, I think, three more years. Um, It's just Anaheim has moved so many defensemen out in the last couple of years. Like They used to be stocked there, stacked there, and now it's a little bit less so. And if you look at their prospect pipeline, it's a there's a ton of forwards coming. You know, some of them are already on the roster. Sam Steele, you got Alex, uh, or sorry, Max Comtois. Um, you know, even a Troy Terry, Isaac Lund is from Troy Terry. Um, you know, you got so many of these guys, and Anaheim has a really good track record of drafting and developing well. So you can feel pretty confident that. Not all, but a lot of these guys are going to come in and, and be NHL players and be productive ones. So you, you got this thing where if teams come after one of their defensemen, does Anaheim really need young forwards? I mean, probably not. You're going to find yourself needing defensemen here very quickly. So it's hard to predict what they're going to do. Bob Murray is, a, I think, a pretty good GM, too. And it's it's they're not even a team that you look at and say they need to blow it up and tear it down. They had a high draft pick, another forward last year, Trevin Zegras. Who? people are raving about yeah and had a great junior and and you're going to get another high pick yeah. this year and you still got 26 year old john gibson in that well, sign. yeah so I, they win know. the draft lottery all of a sudden you're going well we've got the d in place and we've yeah. got these other guys coming we could be great in two years yeah so again like they they could potentially trade some very valuable pieces here but at the same time you can see in a year or two this team being right back up challenge challenging for the pacific division which is just I mean, who knows where the heck that yeah. division is going to go? Bob Murray, one of the GMs Brian Burke dealt with in the wheeling dealing to get the Sedins, and should mention it was Thomas Gradine, as Burke is uh, always uh, quick to give credit to. He was the scout in Sweden who was really hard on the Sedins and twisting his arm mm-hmm. there. So shout out to Gradine and shout out to Ian McIntyre, who's going to join us right here next on Tape to Tape. Hey, time now for our overtime segment brought to you by Subway. No joke. Subway now delivers. Joining us for overtime this episode, it is Ian McIntyre, our Canucks beat writer. Ian, a really, really special night, Wednesday night in Vancouver. Just give us your impressions of uh, what you saw as the Sedins honored their numbers raised to the roof. Well, as I wrote in my story, you know, you can orchestrate these ceremonies but you can't manufacture the emotion that has to be real uh, and genuine. And certainly it was last night, outpouring of love for the Sedins, but not just them, you know, the Canucks, uh, Luongo, uh, Kessler, Linden, Oland, Nasland, a bunch of others and and other players who weren't on the ice. There were a lot of teammates who just had tickets and were in the stands as well. Emotional for them, you know, to get this group together. And really it It was, um, you know, a tremendous honor for the Sedins, but in a way it felt like kind of uh, a bookend to the most successful era in Canuck franchise history where they had those great teams that won President's Trophy and went to the 2011 Stanley Cup. It was a really special night. And one person in particular really seemed touched. That, of course, Ryan Kessler. What did you make of the emotion we saw from that guy who was... Just an absolute beast the year that team went to the cup final. Yeah, well, I think uh, I know that it meant a lot uh, to Ryan because he has spent the last six years since he forced the trade and then lied about it. uh, (laughs) He spent the last six years as one of the most vilified figures in Canuck Nation. And and he was nervous, as, as he said before the ceremony, he was nervous about how he would be how he'd be received because every time he's come back with the Anaheim Ducks, he just gets booed from the start of the game to the end of the game. He, he really was became 
kind of a pariah in this market. So it, it was, I think it was great for the Sedins that all their guests, except Gary Bettman, were, were <laughs> genuinely cheered. But I, I know this was kind of a cathartic night uh, for Ryan Kessler. It was almost like coming back into the Canucks family last night. And it meant a lot to him. I, I'm sure it will help heal uh, this, this wound that has existed uh, for the last six years. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was just a really nice moment, really powerful, poignant moment. You listed a number of great players who were in attendance uh, for that ceremony. Uh, I mean, where do the Sedins rank in terms of all-time Canucks? Is it just easy to say with their accomplishments and, and the, you know, how long they were there uh, that they are one and two? Well, I think they are one and two, but it hasn't always been easy to say that. Uh, their numbers are now unmistakable. I mean, not only are they first and second, in franchise scoring, they are hundreds of points ahead uh, of the next guy, uh, Marcus Naslin. So statistically, there's not much of an argument. But, you know, these were the relationship between the Sedins and Vancouver was complex. It was not smooth sailing early on for them, either on the ice or among the fan base. And it took them a long time to overcome uh, a lot of the stereotypes and the criticisms that were held against them. Mm -hmm. But certainly, you know, the last five years, uh, people ha have realized how special these guys were. They realized it when their career was coming to an end. They realized it after they were gone. Other countrymen, okay. Jacob Markstrom, man, was he uh, amazing in, in the win over Chicago and I mean, I, I don't think there's going to be much news on this front anytime soon. Correct me if I'm wrong, but of course, with every great performance, there the questions about his future. He is a UFA there. Just wondering what your uh, sense is in terms of what might happen there, how that could play out. And of course, the Canucks have an eye to, I mean, they have a few young goalies in the mix with Demko and Michael DiPietro, and they have an expansion draft on the horizon. How do you think this scene is is going to play out? Well, first of all, his his performance last night was beyond incredible. 49 saves in a 3 nothing shutout, and the first 13 shots in the game were by the Chicago Blackhawks. It's almost like the hockey gods had, had ordained that because of the Sedin's night, it was going to be the Canucks game. But if the gods didn't do it, then Jacob Markstrom did. It, it's, it's a really challenging situation uh, for Vancouver. They want to have both goalies, and, and understandably so. If they are successful in that, of course, they're going to have an issue next year with the expansion draft. But that's still more than a year away. They have some time to deal with that. The challenge with Markstrom is, is, I guess it's the challenge with every free agent, money and term. But it, because they have Thatcher Demko and they have such, uh, the organization such a high regard for him, they still envision him as a future starter. But I don't know that you can have that mindset and still fully commit to Jacob Markstrom to the degree necessary to get him signed. You know, Markstrom is having, uh, it probably hasn't gotten enough attention around the league, and I don't think he's going to get enough votes from my Professional Hockey Writers Association, but he really is having a Vezina Trophy candidate kind of season. But will teams shopping for a goalie on July 1st, will they put him ahead of Braden Holtby? You know, there are, there are other really appealing alternatives like, Yaro Halak and Anton Kudobin, who are really good plan B goalies and could certainly help a good team win. And they'll come a lot cheaper. The goalie market is always very difficult to peg. Certainly the way Markstrom's playing, he's not getting any cheaper by the week. And I just think it's going to be a real challenge for Vancouver to find a way to give him uh, enough term and money to get him to resign with Vancouver and yet still maintain some flexibility to do something in the future with Thatcher Demko. But that is that is their objective, and they're sincere about that. They want to keep both guys, and they're going to do what they can to keep Jacob Markstrom. Before we ask you about the trade deadline, I want to touch on Elias Pettersson because there's a, a couple of things 
that are interesting to me around him. Um, we know how he ended last year. It wasn't the strongest finish for him. And, you know, it had to do with the first time going around the NHL and the grind of the schedule and the travel and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then lately, the storyline around him has kind of been the, the on-ice abuse that he's been taking. And, and, you know, now they're in a playoff run. They're leading the Pacific Division right now. So it's going to be an entirely different look down the stretch for him than what he saw last year. So I guess my question would be, how is he dealing with all of this? How do you think he'll, he'll finish down the stretch this year uh, compared to last year? And, and just 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 just. How 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 you think he is handling it, and how you think this is gonna this is gonna wrap up this time? Well, the learning curve is is still steep. You know, he's been so good so quickly. It's easy to forget that he's been a National Hockey League player for all of one and a half seasons. So the, a, a lot is new. The fact that the Canucks are a better team makes it, in a way, harder individually on Pedersen because opponents didn't have to be physical to beat the Canucks in the past. But now teams are taking them a lot more seriously and and are playing the Canucks a lot tougher physically. And within that group, everybody knows that Elias Pettersson is the guy driving the offense. So he's getting a lot of attention. How is he handling it? Well, he's handled everything so far. Uh, I think he's going to have uh, a, a better finish to the season, certainly than a year ago. He said he learned uh, a little bit about having to adjust his game when opponents adjust to him. He certainly is not in the least dissuaded uh, by the physicality. I mean, he's frustrated by it, obviously, sometimes when he's not getting penalty calls. Mm -hmm. But this isn't a guy who, who shies away from uh, a battle or competition. He wants to be the best. He goes to the areas where he needs to to try and be the best. And and I think he's going to be fine. But there is, there is an awful lot of focus on Pedersen and Quinn Hughes from opponents. And these are very, very young players, just 21 and 20 years old, to be handling that. But they're also special players. And and I think they welcome the challenge. So, Ian, today when I was doing the NHL newsletter, I was trying to come up with a trade each Canadian team should explore. And when I got to Vancouver, it's difficult because, first of all, there's not a lot of cap space there to work with. Um, they've already traded away their first round pick, which presumably goes to Tampa Bay this year, which means they're not likely to trade their second round pick either. Uh, and there's no real glaring need on this roster either. So, you know, probably out of the rental market and all that stuff. And I know Brendan, Brendan Dillon is a name that's been possibly linked to Vancouver. What I ultimately settled on was just get a third pair or a number seven defenseman for some veteran depth because injuries are always destined to hit a team this time of the season into the playoffs. But what what kind of player or maybe even a specific player do you think the Canucks uh, will be or should be targeting at the deadline? Well, you're right about uh, cap restrictions and, and asset restrictions because they did give up the first rounder for JT Miller. So, you know, the, I don't think they're going to be able to meet the prices for a lot of these guys. Brendan Dillon would be a fantastic fit because he checks a lot of boxes for them in terms of his physicality, the fact he can play with good players. He, he's a guy who can kind of move up and down the defense at times. And he's played 10 rounds of playoffs in the last four years. And that kind of experience uh, for a Vancouver kid playing on the Canucks would, would be really helpful. But he's going to be expensive as well. I, I would say because the, the scoring for this team, the offense has been one of the biggest surprises this season, and generally the problem hasn't been scoring goals. I would, I would say that the need is uh, for defensive depth, and if they can't get somebody like Brendan Dillon to play in the top four or five, then I think they will try and get uh, another veteran defenseman just for depth. But they are right up to the salary cap. Whatever money they bring in, they're going to have to do something to move that money out. And it's going to be difficult in that context for them to make an impact move. Well, it should be interesting to see how things play out, Ian. Uh, we will be reading your stuff all the way through the stretch run as these Pacific Division leading Canucks uh, make a push for the postseason. Thanks so much for joining us today, Ian. You're welcome. Still hard to believe when you say that. Pacific Division <laughs> leading the Canucks. Yeah, yeah. They are looking good there in that division, Rory. That is really a bit of a jump ball. So we'll see mm -hmm. uh, how things go. I mean, there's still a few teams that uh, that could win it, but Vancouver's been looking good. 
they've got to be. I mean, I guess Columbus gets surprise of the season, but don't you think Vancouver has got to be right in the running for surprise club yeah. of the season? If it's not Vancouver, it's Edmonton. I mean, yeah. uh, it's almost... Whoever wins the Pacific Division is the yeah. surprise team of the year, uh, along with Columbus there. And it's just, it's so hard because one bad stretch and you could be out of the playoffs, one good stretch, you could be leading that division. And funnily enough, the one team that did make a big trade deadline pickup in the Pacific Division, not trade deadline, but a trade pickup, Arizona getting Taylor Hall, has been struggling and falling down. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I remember we had Ian on a few years ago. I'd say a couple years ago, and he talked about, uh, I remember he used the phrase, the thin edge of the wedge, when it came to the Canucks prospects, mm -hmm. and, and and things really are starting to come to fruition. That was before we even knew, I think, how, you know, we were talking about uh, Pedersen as a guy who was challenging Peter Forsberg's records in Sweden, but we yes. didn't know exactly how it was going to go. And of course, yeah, you talk about Sweden, yes, very special night for, I think, everyone in attendance uh, in Vancouver on Wednesday night, seeing those Sedin jerseys going to the Raptors. Thanks so much to Ian McIntyre for uh, giving us a little peek behind the curtain about what that evening was like and what it meant to the Vancouver faithful. We are almost there, Rory. Trade deadline is upon us, so make sure you're checking back next week for more glass rattling hockey action and trade talk on Tape to Tape.